I just turned my Wi-Fi on, so hopefully that uh, fixes it. Okay. All right, we are live on Facebook. I am going to share my screen and get everybody in here. My name is Corey Jo Biddle, and I'm the executive director of Fuel Milwaukee and the host of today's space special Race Bridge Conversation. We're calling it Community Bridge, and we're discussing the rise in auto thefts, joyriding, and reckless driving that have been an epidemic throughout so many of our communities. This is a topic that has been somewhat racialized. We could have probably called it Race Bridge, but for our focus today, the discussion really boils down to community and the power we have to make change collectively. Our discussion is organized in partnership with Milwaukee Films Cultures and Communities Festival, which is a week of screenings and events focused on traditionally marginalized communities. Their focus is on creating transformative experience for everyone who attends the film screenings and the discussions that they're hosting. This is taking place right now. So it started September, 6th, September 6th and is going through the 12th. Uh, the Cultures and Community Festival is an in-person and virtual series, so hybrid, series of events featuring 20 films, several workshops, and several panels. So this discussion is powered by the film that's gonna be showing tomorrow called All These Sons. This film, follows two Chicago men who have dedicated their lives to the education, empowerment, and healing of young Black men um, in danger of committing or committing or falling victim to gun violence. Their community-based, again, community-based approach tests their faith, faith as they aim to bring healing to those who desperately need it. This is a documentary that was uh, uh, premiere, that premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival and is now showing at um, our Cultures and Communities Festival tomorrow at 7.30 at the Oriental Theater. There's also an in-person discussion. If you go to milwaukeefilm.org, you can find out all about the 20 events that they're having or have had for the series. 
figure out how to get tickets for this film and others and participate in the complimentary um, discussions, either in person or virtually. So that leads us to today's conversation. Car theft in Milwaukee is on the rise and it's having a huge impact on our communities. Countless articles, news reports have been highlighting the issues, making car owners aware of the risk. There are even Facebook groups. I, mean, I know a lot of you know about these Facebook groups where people are posting their cars in hopes of finding them and businesses are booming with folks who are driving the streets in hope of uh, recovering stolen cars. I mean, this is a hot topic right now. It's really affecting our community in so many different ways. So why is it so hot? Lots of people know that, you know, car theft has been on the rise, but the pandemic saw a huge jump. So double. In July, TMJ4 reported that in the first seven months of the year, the number of cars stolen in the city had increased by nearly 200%. So between the first of the year and July 6th, there were 1,686 cars reported stolen in the city of Milwaukee. That's according to police records. Um, this year, that number skyrocketed to 4,949 and is rising. Um, at this point, the numbers are um, higher. As I was doing research, I kind of thought it was interesting that this sort of ABC insurance company um, provides for their uh, customers information about where cars are being stolen the most and Milwaukee actually landed as number 12 on that graphic. This is actually from 2018. I have another graphic that's a little older but I think illustrates the point of what's happening now. The age in folks who are being pursued or chased or convicted in car theft is kind of going down. Those numbers, the, those ages are becoming younger and younger. And it's really why we wanted to have this conversation because obviously this affects all of our communities because nobody wants to have their car stolen. It's a huge financial strain on a lot of people. It's inconvenient, it's, it's dangerous when you have so many young people, some of them who don't have licenses um, you know, driving and hurting people, killing people, hurting property. There are a lot of issues around it, but I want us to keep in mind that a lot of these people are young and they're, in, in many cases, they're kids. So we have a panel of folks that can speak to the issues, help everybody feel like they are as uh, safe and protected as possible, but also get to the point of solution. So I'm going to introduce my uh, panel here. First up, we have Shannon, Sh sorry, Shannon King, who is the CEO of Peace of Heart LLC. Hi, Shannon. Hello. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for, Thanks for having me here. We also have Kweku Tiangelo Cargile of the city of Milwaukee. His uh, position there is Youth Injury and Violence Prevention Coordinator, and he's out of the office of Milwaukee's, City of Milwaukee's Office of Violence Prevention. Is that right, Kweku? Right on point. Thanks for having me this afternoon. Thank you for being here. Of course, we have Vaughn Mays, who is the founder of Program the Parks, MKE. And there's a, there another um, affiliation that I was supposed to mention, uh, Vaughn. With, come back, come back. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, program the parks and something else you told me to mention. I didn't write it down. Oh, Comforce MKE, short for Community Task Force MKE. Okay, perfect. So I want to, before we get into the questions or start talking about the topic, quickly, if you can give us like a, a 60 second overview of the work that you do, like how are you um, a, a spending your time making different changes in the community and how does this topic touch the work that you do every day? Shannon, I'll start with you. Awesome. Uh, well, I'm a youth workshop facilitator. I did CPS over uh, 10 years with kids. So I kind of know all about kids. So I'm toe to toe with Kia boys. I'm toe to toe with Kia girls. I'm in court ordered workshops, detention centers, group homes, residential treatment facilities. And I basically just do a self perception workshop where we kind of teach each other and figure out what is going on with y'all. That's what I do. And I just basically help them reach their goals. So Shannon, I just found out about the Kia, Kia boys. Kia, what tell tell the folks who don't know what those 
are those yeah so the the kia boys and the kia girls are um certain individual young boys and girls who have labeled themselves Kia boys and Kia girls because they enjoy uh, stealing vehicles and more so these vehicles are Kia. Um, and then it ties to a lot of different things as far as their dancing and some other things that they do under their Kia name. Yeah. So it's like popularized the stealing of cars. It's sort of like a social kind of, currency thing. Yeah, kind of like a, a little gang that steals cars. Yeah. Kweku, go ahead. You could tell us a little bit about the work that you do at OVP and how does this issue touch the work that you do every day? Yeah, thank you again. Um, so my work is around uh, primary prevention. So I do public health strategy work around youth development. So in my specific role, I make sure that young people don't get to these situations where they might be Kia boys or Kia girls. We figure out what is the, the pipeline programming? What are the opportunities? What are the investments needed for young people for them to be successful in pursuing their dreams? So I do that in a lot of different ways. Um, that usually presents itself through collective impact initiatives around out of school time, around opportunity youth, which we'll be talking about a little bit later, and some of that work even around financial literacy for young people and their families. So there's a lot of different things, but yeah, those are how this connects to that work is we want to make sure again that young people don't get to this point. We want to make sure that they are given um, opportunities and access um, to different resources that'll funnel them or show them what they're actually passionate about, what they're good at, what are their skills, what do they want to improve. Um, so in primary prevention, that's what we prioritize. That's awesome. Thank you. Vaughn, how about you? Tell us a little bit about the work that you've been doing. You're on mute. On mute. So we have a multi-pronged approach being through program of parks and through Comforce. Program of Parks is a youth-centered organization work that centers predominantly out of city and county parks throughout Milwaukee. Um, and we focus on supporting families through, through youth as the focus and then connecting uh, the youth and the family um, to resources and programs as needed. Um, but then through Comforce, um, violence in intervention work, um, dealing with different aspects of the home, things are going on as far as um, you know, advocacy, again, connecting people to resources, if there's emergency homelessness, things of that nature, um, mixed in with like a mentoring type of uh, approach in the community, directly where people are. Um, so being that um, trusted, um, you know, credible messenger that can relate to what's going on out there, that's been a part of it, that, that's lived through it. Um, you know, as T. Angelo said, you know, just connecting with different groups to try and one, prevent them uh, from getting into activity. Um, if they're involved in it, trying to deter them or give them other alternatives to, um, to break away from that um, and, and things of that nature. Perfect. We got the perfect panel for this discussion. So as we, in the intro, as we were kind of teeing up our talk today, I talked about this, you know, 200% increase. Like this, that's huge. I mean, it's like astronomical and it's shocking. To what do you all attribute that increase? Where is it, where is it coming from from your viewpoint and the work that you're doing and what you've seen in the community? I think it, uh, it stems from the kids, um, the pandemic and the pandemic of being bored and then just trying to find something to do and then oh this is the new it so it's like huh wake up and i'm a rebel today what should i do today to get in trouble um and then just also some of the kids are younger so they're looking up to the role models who are older and they're like oh i want to do that you know pick me up or can i get in you know so just boredom and um just curiosity and also i think the grand theft auto game has a lot to do with some of that too <laughs> yeah yeah, I bet it came up in the research when I was preparing for this, the uh, the auto, Grand Theft Auto games and the, some of the songs. And even in some different cities, there are legislators that are trying to ban video games that have depictions of auto theft and that they feel like it has that much of an impact on um, such young, That's good. young kids. My son is is 10 and he tried to trick me into letting him have Grand Theft Auto. He said, mom, can I have, um, can I have GTA 5 on Xbox? <laughs> and I was like, 
I almost said yeah, but then I was like, wait, what is GTA Five? And then his dad was like, Grand Theft Auto. I'm like, no, you can't, because he know he he knows he can't have it. But I mean, they're obsessed with that game, and it is graphic for those who have it. It's terrible. It's terrible. It's I, I, I definitely want to to add to that piece, especially around GTA. GTA is rated M for mature. So you're not even supposed to be able to play that game unless you're 17. Thank you. So when so when they're talking about banning that game, that doesn't need, <laughs> you know, it says on the packaging, this right. is for 17 and older. This is for a mature audience. So and and I'm glad uh that you Corey recognized that, you know, or you know, his father recognized that, hey, this is this is not for you. Yeah. So I, I, I think we all have a role to play in making sure that our young people are doing things that are connected to their age group. Yeah. Uh, so even when we talk about shooting games, right, these games are rated M for mature. They are not for youth. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I just wanted to make sure I preface that because um, I enjoy those games myself. I know all the video game a, players. I am an like adult. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I am an adult. You know what yeah. I mean? So it, it is cool for us to play those games, but we recognize that it's just gameplay. This is not real. And for our younger ages, they sometimes it is difficult to make that distinction. Mm -hmm. um, so I just want to make sure that we preface that in saying that. You know, and, and if I'm, I, honest, I'm not even sure how he knows about the game. You know, it's like, how do you even know? I guess maybe YouTube, maybe he's seeing people playing it on. I don't yeah. know. That must be, it's I'm like, how do you even know that this everywhere. exists? They play it online together so they get invites mm -hmm. on twitch all type of stuff <laughs> all different all different like safe outlets uh for young people to get access to these games but i know that's not what we're talking about today um so i agree with shannon 100 percent. it's the pandemic the pandemic has impacted the education system out of school time why wouldn't it impact crime of which we all know very clearly that it has um so the pandemic is really the root um, of these explosion of um, stealing cars and reckless driving. Vaughn, any thoughts? What is what is going on? Why is this happening? So it's a number of things. Um, one, I absolutely, as um, Angelo said, um, I don't like that people uh, preference or try to make the game the reason because it is not, I, as a young person who stole cars, that was predominantly the crime that we did because stealing cars is not new. Um, there's a, a number of reasons that people, specifically young people, steal cars. And it's not all just for joyriding. Um, there were people who were paying us to go find cars of a certain make or model for mm. parts. Um, so there's the financial aspect of it. Of course, there's the fun part of it. But then not also the, the issue of the theft. Young people are also learning to drive. At the same time, they're still in these cars. They don't know what they're doing behind the wheels. So that's a huge aspect of it, um, which is why we are also seeing such the huge number of crashes and the recklessness of the driving. You know what I'm saying? Because they're also learning and teaching themselves at the same time that they're still in the cars, which is literally how I learned to drive by stealing cars. Nobody sat me down. I didn't go through. Uh, I, and I'm just being honest. And this is one of the reasons. Tell why the I people, Vaughn. Tell the people. For real. <laughs> I've been able to connect with these young people because I know what they're doing and I know a, a, a huge reason of why they're doing it and what it looks like. Um, and of course the pandemic has a huge effect right now, you know, people's um, time, um, especially with school being out the past year, year and a half, almost two years, whatever the case may be, that is idle time that young people have to just wander around and not have anything to do. So now you have more hours where you can be out in the community and, and get into these things. Um, there's the social media aspect of it because a lot of them are also doing it for likes and views and to post it and to get, you know, attention, um, essentially. So there's a lot of different aspects, but the pandemic absolutely has a huge, huge reason to why we're seeing the jump and the rise in the behaviors and the, the negative uh, impacts of it. Vaughn, what, how old were you when you were uh, still in cars? From 15 to... 18. In fact, well, I, I didn't steal the cars. The people who I was friends with stole the cars and I just went with them, mm -hmm. essentially. Um, so I was a passenger. At some points I helped, you know, I was there during the stealing of the car, things of that nature. So 
I know what it's like, especially as a homeless teenager, where these are people I had to be around. We were kind of either homeless together or I was staying with friends and this is what they did. So it, this is what I did or had to do um, to be part of those groups. Um, so I, I, I know exactly, you know what I'm saying, being in them situations, um, what it's like. Um, so yeah, I was, I was in that age bracket. And in fact, the last incident that I had was when I was 18 years old. Um, I was no longer stealing cars. But uh, a friend of mine picked me up in a stolen car <laughs> and he ran and I stayed and, and I ended up getting a case for that. They actually charged me with theft of the car, mm -hmm. um, which I should have never been charged with that. But that has affected my life since I was 18 years old. Mm -hmm. So, um, again, I know on a, on a huge level what it is to be be part of that stuff. And just to drive home the part about the game, um, I don't see anybody blaming Fast and Furious. Fast and Furious is literally a whole series of movies that mm. is huge around the world that's based on car theft. So there's a, a number of, um, you know, things that we can blame, but these are, you know, accessible. You know, crime is um, proximity and opportunity. You know what I'm saying? So um, these are the things that we have to do in our community. And unfortunately, the type of cars that we have right now it has never been this easy to steal cars. I can literally tell you, it petrified me to have to steal cars back then because it took so long. You have to pry and pry. It was points where people would come out their house and be standing at the window watching us steal their car. And I'll be like, like, they could shoot us right now. You know, oh like I was, I was petrified, you know, because, and so it's never been this easy. Every yeah. kid knows how to steal cars right now. That has never happened. So this is also part of the not problem. Every kid. I, I, not I don't every mean kid knows how to steal a car. Those who will take that literally, but <laughs> they will. But there's lot, they they, will. I, there's video. I mean, it will. There, I have some data too about the cars and certain cars are easier and why. But there, a lot of people are putting it on YouTube. The cars that are easier, and that is why so many of the kids are getting access. They know how to do it, even if you weren't didn't come up stealing cars. I was in a stolen car. My, my friend took her mama's car keys out of the purse and we went somewhere when I was a, when I was a kid. Um, but something similar happened to my brother where somebody picked him up in a stolen car, got chased by the police. They ran into a concrete pole, crashed the car, almost died. He never got in trouble again. It completely, um, com he just, it just never got in trouble again. He, it just had such a huge impact on him, but he was a little bit older. He's like, 17, 18, he, he was on, already on the path to being who he is today. But a lot of these kids are younger and, and being influenced by a lot of different things, which is why so many communities, including ours, are saying the pandemic has played a huge role because they're not connected to, um, well, now folks are, more folks are in person, but certainly when they weren't in person, all the recreation, they can't, you know, they can't be face to face. This is all, you know, these are younger folks. I know you have some, some information or data about like the, the, who's doing this, how old are they, are they? And then let's talk about what that, what that means for them. Yeah. Cause I know we oftentimes talk about young people generally um, around the stealing of cars. So I definitely did my own data search. Um, this is from the Legislative uh, Reference Bureau. Um, so, and this is specific to Wisconsin. So around arrests, um, operating a vehicle without the owner's consent, the median age is 17 to 21. Mm -hmm. The average number of arrests for reckless driving is also 17 to 21. When we talk about citations, the average number of charges for operating without an owner's consent is 16 and younger. Um, and then for carjacking, again, it's 17 to 21. These are median, these are averages. Um, we've all, I'm sure, have seen someone on the road who was driving recklessly who was older than that. But if we're talking about simply the averages, that is the, the median age, 17 to 21, um, around arrests and citations, it can be younger. Shannon, we were talking yesterday about some of the young people that you've been talking to and just sort of like stay, trying to steer them clear. And the, you were, you know, you realize how they, you realize how young they are when they start to talk about why they're doing this, what they think the consequences are. Can you talk a little bit about that and what your experience has been? What are they saying? What is their mindset? What do they think is going to happen? Do they even realize the, the impact that it's having on our community? Yeah. Um, with my experience, um, 
basically I let the kids talk and I'm listening to them and I ask them to come up with scenarios. We do mock court hearings and they're like, okay, it's like, it's seven of us in a car. And I say, okay, it's seven of us in a car. What else? And uh, we got guns. I say, okay, how many, how many guns do you guys have? I'm just like blown away while they're talking, but I have to listen. And they're like, we all got two guns. So it's 10 guns in the car. I'm like, what? I say, okay, how many kids? There's seven of us, two in the trunk. What? Like, <laughs> So um, as they're talking, the youngest that I've had was 11. Um, in my workshop, the youngest I have is an 11 year old. And um, it's interesting that you said that because I guess I was in a stolen car in fifth grade. My friend um, took her mom's car and I got in and I drove too. So that's interesting. I never thought of that. I was in a stolen car. Yeah, so I think it's, it's basically they kind of just get geeked by their other friends and um, then this song and this dance. So they're kind of learning this dance and then they think that they can do the dance on top of cars. A lot of the kids have told me that there have been car dealerships who give them money too for cars and parts like Vaughn was saying earlier, wow. um, call it branding. So they take the car, it, it can be a car that doesn't even start and they will take that car and get it somehow some way to where they need it and sell all the parts. Um, a lot of the kids are telling me that to me, the, uh, the adrenaline, they like the adrenaline and they enjoy um, the crashes. One of the kids told me he had three crashes in one day. I'm like, what? Um, do you think you're a cat? So then he said the first accident was with a tow truck and his mom don't know. So they have all these wow. keep living through it. So after they smack one car, they find another car. So I don't I don't understand them, um, but I think it's just boredom and just adrenaline and fun to them. Yeah, I think when you say their the mom didn't know, I think that was interesting because when my brother, when he left the house, he left the house to go to a party with a friend that was known. He had been in our home. It was some, my mother didn't think anything of it. You know, she's like, okay, see you later. He got in the car and realized once they were in the car that the car was stolen. I mean, and not all of these kids get into these situations in different ways or they get introduced to it. Once you're riding in a stolen car, you're more likely to, you know, it, does, it desensitizes you to the, the act of actually doing. But there is a process, like a mental process that people go through. And I mentioned that because I know, I mean, I, I was going to bring somebody from one of the Facebook groups, but I decided not to because so much of it is like, you know, where they mama's at and what you know all of that kind of sentiment which I do understand but it is it sometimes it's just more complicated than that and the parents don't even realize if they if these kids don't get caught if my brother hadn't gotten caught that night we would have had no idea because he wasn't a, he wasn't he never got in trouble but it's like he was around friends yeah. and that's kind of what it was Vaughn yeah. did you want to say something yeah, um, I think a central piece of this that we um, are talking about, what people need to focus on is the, the ability to steer them clear of these situations. Um, when COVID first hit, it, it literally caused a lapse in access and engagement of youth. We could no longer be in the parks with our young people. And not only did, they, that, that, did that put them back out into the community individually all over the city where we, they're not being monitored, they're not being engaged positively, now they're back in home situations or around other influences where these things, you know, where someone is not steering them clear. You know what I mean? Um, and for Shannon, um, I think it's more of the, the walking away from or getting away from the crashes rather than it is to actually crash. It's like, a, um, like you said, that adrenaline piece of it. it it's, it's almost like they're accumulating war stories. These are their own versions of war stories. Like I'm tough. I crashed the car and I walked away from it. And that was, you know, that is, it's more of that mental aspect for them. And then another part that you just touched on, these adults, they have like, we have such, you know, a lot of people get older and then they act as if they were never adults or kids or teenagers themselves. You know how you thought or didn't think, you know about the stuff you got into regardless of what your parents said, you know what I mean? Like that aspect is lost and people are really focusing on the, the theft or the, the activity or the incident rather than what these, like we're talking about children. You know what I'm saying? When you're talking about 11 year olds, when you're talking about girls um, doing a lot of this stuff, a lot of that is there, there isn't a real thought process or a, a real um, assessment of this is what can happen. You know what I mean? Like they don't think about them things. They're just doing them. You know what I mean? And especially if, as a kid, if you see this car go past, this is a 13-year-old or a 15-year-old driving in and you're 11, 
And you're so, it's a kid driving it. Nobody stopped him. He isn't getting in trouble. Well, let me try it because maybe that looks fun. Plus, I could get away with it. I can do it real quick and nobody will know. And, and everybody will see me. And, you know, these are situations that kids are and, and young people are put in. And, and all the time, they're not thinking of the consequences and not considering those things. So the steering clear part, having someone there um, consistently, positively, that is, that'll say, don't do that. We, that's not in place around this community um, outside of spaces um, that they, that they had access to more be, before the, the pandemic. Shannon, y'all know you were talking and you can share with this uh, group that you were, you're working on a, um, a visual, like a video um, or a commercial to help the kids understand the impact or the gravity of what could happen. And we were telling me yesterday how they think, oh, you know, we're kids, adults won't shoot us or, you know, this won't happen. Talk a little bit about that and then how you, what you're trying to do to get them to, to wake up and really see that this is serious. Yeah, they're, they're untouchable. So they feel like they're untouchable and they, they just have um, this type of superpower, I guess, uh, infinity. Um, so um, Tracy Dent reached out to me. He was a part of a reckless driving movement and um, he started something where he paid some of the children in St. Charles um, a stipend if they came up with a slogan. So they came up with a slogan, don't be a clown, slow down. So he's still like in the midst of everything with reckless driving and doing things like that. Um, as far as what I was wanting to do, I wanted to do a public service announcement that will make the kids like jaw drop. So I have to do trial and error with these kids. I've talked to the kids about it. Um, so that's what I'm working on now, me and a few other people. Um, and it has to deal with um, funeral home. So it's just real deep. Um, I'm hearing a lot of kids saying, no, it's trauma. It brings up trauma. You know, my dad died and a lot, but you're still in cars. Do your dad want you to do that? You know, so I understand the trauma, but at the same time, I have we have to figure out how can we reach these Milwaukee kids and we can't reach them. Uh, everybody's doing different things. I think Washington High School had um, kids laying down last week or something on the ground and things like that. So everybody's just trying to come up with something. So I'm just trying to come up with something and I, I need help, too. So anybody. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah, and I wanna, yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. No, I just wanted to jump in because I'm glad Shannon said that kind of follows up uh, a piece that Vaughn was talking about as well. We're talking about primary prevention. We're talking about making sure young people have knowledge about an experience so that they don't even want that type of negative experience or giving them outlets to better opportunities. So as I stated earlier, we're talking about an age group that we call opportunity youth, um, underserviced and undereducated. Um, and there's an Opportunity Youth United, which is a collective of Opportunity Youth um, nationally that spoke about uh, what their recommendations are. And I kind of want to read some of those for you all as well, because sure. we, we often talk about um, the age group and we don't actually listen to what they're telling us they need. And they're telling us the same thing that Shannon and Vaughn are saying. Um, you know, some of those, they said effective, comprehensive programs. So education, job training, counseling. They're talking about national service. So making sure that they have adequate access to AmeriCorps, service learning, et cetera. Um, private internships, which means, you know, a, pay, a paid employment opportunity specific to their age group. All forms of mentorship, because all of us know we need mentors forever, right? Starting at a young age, all the way through adulthood. Um, access to higher education, which means affordable opportunities to expand their pathways to success. Yeah, we can say go to college, but if you can't afford $2,000 a month in tuition, you can't go. So we have to talk about affordable education. Uh, and then we have to talk about diversion and re-entry programs. Because in the justice system where they're, you know, in theory it's violence prevention, but we have to make sure that when a young person is in the justice system, that they have adequate opportunities inside so that when they come out, they're prepared and adequately trained to go get a living wage job. If you just send someone to sit in a cell for five years and you taught them and you educated them with nothing, what are you expecting them to do when they come out? We have to make sure that they're adequately prepared and trained so when they come out, it's easier for them to get living wage employment, not just a job, living wage employment to where they can actually sustain and provide for themselves and their families if they have them. Vaughn, your focus too is on uh, engagement, prevention, um, solutions, dealing with the individuals who are highly likely to 
you know, be involved with this activity because they just don't have anything else to do. What what kinds of programs and services are you offering? How are you getting them engaged? Through things that they're interested in. We just had a, a tournament, a basketball tournament. Um, we try to, you know, if, if they are interested in basketball, they're interested in sports, if they're interested in, you know, different things, we try to encourage them or create um, different events around what their interests are and push them towards that. And um, another thing that we've been doing um, is one, I've had a different experience that a lot of people did not get to have, which was I get to, I got to grow up somewhere else and see something outside of Milwaukee, hmm. see a different culture, a different community aspect. So one of the things that I've been doing with my Comforce work, there have been um, two incidents earlier in the year where we did disaster relief, uh, one in two cities in Texas and one in two cities in Mississippi. So we've been even taking young people along with us there, not only to help with that disaster relief work, but to go out and sightsee and see different parts of the the country that you know mm -hmm. um that they haven't gotten to see and and have some fun and see some different sites so we're looking to hopefully get these kids out of their their typical environment because some of us have never left our block have never left the north side have never left the city of milwaukee or gone anywhere other than chicago really so when you expand people's minds and show them that it's something outside of here then you can give them that um, exposure that there, there's something different that they can look forward to in life. And a lot of us don't get, don't get that. And so um, just cultivating and, and trying to expose us to as many extra opportunities, um, you know, as, as possible um, and, and supporting and surrounding them with, with everything possible in those aspects. Shannon and Kwaku, anything you want to add? Um, can you say the question one more time? Just what, sorry, are, what, are ready, seeing, <laughs> folks, what are you seeing folks do to keep, you know, get people engaged, to get the youth engaged and kind of steer? I mean, we can, I mean, I think we're, this is consistent. Every city has said these kids are bored. It's not that there are, most of them are not doing it because they want to be career car theft experts. This is to them. It's just something to do. If you give them something else to do that really engages them, it like turns the whole ship. What are you seeing in the community? What organizations, what things, what programs, like anything that you can mention that you've seen um, crop up? Well, I've developed a hardcore reckless driving curriculum and it works with the kids. Um, so the curriculum uh, deals with like hands-on safe space talk where we're talking about it. And then we basically also do um, mock traffic stop violations where they have all the legal documents. You have your license, you have your CCW, you have your insurance and you're in a legit car versus you don't have none of that and you're in a stoley. So mm -hmm. basically officer will pull you over and what are you going to do? And then they like run and they run in the hallway and then they hide. Um, and one hid for a while and I'm still teaching my workshop and I'm like, where is John Doe? And he was gone. And they said, Miss Shannon, we, we hide all night until the morning. I'm like, dude, you uh, until the morning? So, um, so basically we just do these things and they kind of teach us. So we do plays like where they make up the skit and we kind of just act out what they do. And then they, they notice, dude, what am I doing? And why am I doing this? Um, so I'm also tying working with um, the Department of Juvenile Corrections, uh, Watertown Plank Road, the detention center. Um, they've been trying to implement a juvenile justice reform for the past three years. Um, as you know, I don't know, Lincoln Hills is on the verse of closing and there's other different juvenile facilities that have opened. They're trying to get more funding in Milwaukee and stop getting the funding outside of Milwaukee. Uh, so they asked me, hey, Shannon, can we tie your reckless, curric reckless curriculum workshops with our new program. So now what they're doing when the children are in DT, they're allowing them to get a free driver's education class. So they're teaching them how to drive and pass and get their permit, get their license. And then I'm also tying my reckless cur driving curriculum with that. So that's a good thing, I guess, because the kids don't even know kind of what they should do to get their license. So now they're in DT stuck. Now they can kind of work on something there that's positive. So that's something that they're doing. This is a question. You, you all might be closer to this and might know. When I, when I remember when I was in high school, they started to take driver's ed out of high school. So luckily, I had a stable job at the Pick and Save on 76 in Good Hope back in the day as a cashier. And I was able to pay for my own, um, I don't know, maybe it was like method 
Yeah, it, it, I was in that too. It cost me $300. Yeah, it did. Now it's 25 bucks. I paid my daughter. She went to Obama for one month. So oh, really? Okay, good. Okay, that's good. And yeah. Let me let me speak to um, what Shannon just talked about, that $25 piece. So specifically, um, so that's MPS Drive, right? So during the 2017, 2018 year, a little over 1,800 students went through driver's education. The reality is, there are 13,000 young people who are driver's license age. Mm. So we really have to talk about the investment that's needed for our mm -hmm. young people to get driver's education. Because people will talk about, oh yeah, we got 1,800 kids who went through driver's education. But there are 13,000 of them who, are, who should have the same level of accessibility to that. And that kind of ties in um, to what I want to talk about. Because what I really want to talk about, what's really important is Shannon and Vaughn are really talking about programming opportunities, making sure that young people have access to things and see that they wouldn't have access to just on their own. So there's a collective called Beyond the Bell Milwaukee, which is a collective organization that supports um, out of school time and the upliftment of youth development. So what we recognized very early on in the pandemic, that there's no real resource guide outside of MKE Rec that shows you what is accessible for young people. So we hosted an event in March where we created a resource guide to be able to express all the opportunities that are available to young people. Um, that website has officially been released as of this week. It's called uh, btbmke.com. And it has a very thorough list of youth serving agencies across the city. It's not all of them. So there's opportunity for youth serving agencies who are not on there to get on that list. And there's also an events page, there's an opportunities page, because we recognize there needs to be an opportunity where young people, their parents and those who oversee young people know, hey, look at, because I did, I did this for my little sister. I literally took the resource guide, put it in her hand and I said, scroll through this and tell me what you want to do. She found like three things she wanted to do. So, but in, 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 in theory, that's so simple, but it wasn't readily accessible for young people. So we recognize that we created that resource guide with the support of the mayor's office. So shout out to them um, and the Beyond the Bell Collective. Um, but yeah, so btbmke.com is a resource guide. Um, that's It's a living resource guide. So we'll be actively adding um, information and programs to it. So Peace of Heart LLC, I need you to go on there, do the Google form so I get your information so I can put you on there. Um, but we need to make sure that we create accessible ways for young people to create unique opportunities. Yeah, Holly Kent said something uh, similar about having young people having knowledge and access to what's available. Um, in this case, she's talking about they have a disability and how they can work with their school at a young age to learn about job planning and what's available beyond um, high school. Um, she references the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation for work in job training. I remember at that age, everybody wanted a job. We just were like, we. some of us were too young to even work. We had to get the our parents to sign the little waiver if you were 15 or 14, so you could be a bagger at Pick and Say. You know, they they definitely want to be doing something productive. I think the willingness is there, but it's like you said, Kwaku, it's like they have to have access and we got to do, do what we can to make it accessible and as easy as, as, easy as possible. Yes. I also want to go back just real quick, and Mr. Vaughn, I'm sorry. Um, as far as the road testing in the driving school, the only thing that I don't like is the road test waiver. So just like you were just saying, sir, um, basically what they're doing is allowing parents to sign a road test waiver because of COVID. So the kids don't have to be in a car with the road test driver. Um, so there are parents that are signing a road test waiver, and I'm not one of them. So my daughter was mad at me because she's like, mom, just sign my waiver and then I can just get my license. And I'm like, no, I need you to get the experience. So there's, like you just said, the statistics, there's so many kids out here that probably got their license because their parent signed the waiver and they didn't pass the road test physically. Set another setup. Yeah, it's crazy. I also um, grid MKE. I just put that in a chat. That's just a, a resources right in your pocket for kids who aged out or anything. It has resources, jobs, housing, and different things for kids. Sorry. So there's a question in the um, in the Q and A. Um, someone asked, "Why is it easier to steal cars now?" We kind of referenced that a little bit earlier in 
um, the conversation. I think I actually have a slide. I do kind of want to provide resources for, for people to protect their um, their cars and have it, you know, as safe as possible. This is information that um, has come from the uh, police department. So two thirds of the cars stolen through July 11th in the city of Milwaukee were made by uh, Kia or Hyundai. Um, and then at the bottom, there's an asterisk of the, these, these models in particular. And so from what I have read and seen on YouTube and everything that I've been reading in the, in the research, there is a design flaw um, in those cars, which makes it easier to take those cars, to, to break into the car without the alarm going off and also to mess with the lock so that you can drive it without a without the lock or anything being in there. There's like a bunch of flaws um, with it. This is this is why. So these cars, everything I'm reading about it, there was some folks tweeting about like these cars are way easier uh, to steal. If you have a car like this, you're being um, told to use a, a club or some other kind of device. So we've had actually some of our legislators and legislators around the nation have reached out to the manufacturers of those cars. Uh, TMJ4 reached out also and both of those companies said they're aware of the rise in the car thefts. Um, they said that they're working with Milwaukee police to offer anti-theft steering wheel locks to drivers. I did see that some investment has been made and they're supposed to send thousands, um, thousands more, but there's been like a first batch. So reach out to your police department, reach out to the manufacturers if you have one of those cars to make sure that they are um, as safe as possible. Our legislators, um, two in particular, uh, Alderwoman Coggs and Alderman Rainey have reached out to both of those manufacturers, let them know specifically what is happening in Milwaukee to make them aware of the problem and to really encourage them to, to fix it um immediately and depending on that on how they respond Alder Wood McCogg said depending on how they respond we'll um offer up some uh legal options as to how the city can respond and um and react to to that so that's sort of the answer as to why though these cars in particular if you have one of those cars make sure um you have you know you protect Anything else that you all know about, like what are folks with those cars that you know of in the community doing? I know a lot of people are getting a club and I haven't seen clubs in years and it's like everybody's getting a club and putting it on their car right now. Um, police are telling people to make sure they lock their cars. Lots of folks don't lock their cars. Lots of folks in the winter get out of the car and run and do something at the gas station and leave the car, the key in the car, all, you know, all of those kinds of um, things. Any thoughts from the panel on that? It's risky. I know I have a friend that used two clubs on her car. Um, and then I noticed that there's an increase on Craigslist with Kias that's on sale. So there's a lot of people trying to get rid of their Kias now too. Get rid of it? That might be. Yeah, look, this is what, if you look in the comments, Liza says they, they actually, people know how to remove the clubs. The yeah. best advice is if you have one of those cars. Um, mm -hmm. they're, they're cutting through locks. They're there's ways you can cut the steering wheel and remove it it's just all time and, and again social media youtube um there's and there's information of ways that people have access to that is showing them how to do a number of things mm -hmm. um and, and even more so you have the community who put up a huge fight with the the uh the car companies even being any liable for this but they're selling these particular cars with this you know you know, with them being this easy to steal, that's a flaw in the in the creation of the the um the product. And so people were even like, this has nothing to do, it's not their fault. Yes, it is, because when you're talking about criminal activity, you cannot expect for people who are doing a crime to follow the rules. So that that means that everybody else has to take extra precaution to make that not easy for them. You know what I mean? Or to to um especially when you're selling a product. But um, another thing that I wanted to touch on is when you talk about things that's out there, we I, I've been advocating for access to a facility because, of course, when you talk about arresting people, ticketing people, 
um, putting people on it. Lincoln Hills is still around, all these different things that we have. Those are not answers or solutions to what's going on with our young people. And so we need a, a community resident orientated led and involved facility that we can go in with these programs, things that we know that works to actually work on the behavioral aspects and to actually work on changing because, you know, youth imprisonment is just as much as a behavioral correction as adult prison or jail. We know that what happens in Lincoln Hills and the experiences of jail and the court system, that those are compounders of traumas and different experiences. That's not a help. And so when you got everybody just looking to arrest these kids and send them to prison and give them more time, we're just creating a problem that's going to carry on into the adult prison system where we can we can really put a handle on that now. Um, again, like, it, it's, it's really crazy how we do things and how we look at things and we continue to do things that we know are not going to work. Um, but we have to make that investment in our young people because I believe we all know our young people are our future. And when we have so many of our young people, not only going through these experiences and, and, and engaging in this activity, who do we have to look forward to, you know, in, in our future to run this country, to run this city? We have to do something now. And I don't think that direness um, about saving them in that aspect, that is not paid enough attention on. It's more about the punitive correction, uh, uh, you know, um, I don't even know the word, like just, mm -hmm. You know, just Short jumping at them in that one aspect of punishment is is what the focus is. And it's that's not going to change this. I definitely agree and with you. And that's one thing Tracy Dent is doing. He's doing a petition for more sentencing, like you said, and longer. And I don't think, yeah, I definitely agree with you. That's not gonna help them. Because we there's an organization called Youth Justice Milwaukee. Um, it's a grassroots organization. They've done great work around the closing of Lincoln Hills and Copper Lake. Um, but as we all know, um, the higher ups in our political system paused that, halted that, call it what you want to, um, because it, it was definitely at the cusp where it was going to close. Uh, but yeah, definitely look up and, and figure out how you can better support Youth Justice MKE. Youth Justice MKE, I'll find the, that link and drop it. I also want to share, um, we are partnering with Mentor Milwaukee next week for a virtual version of our adopt, nine, adopt a nonprofit program. So Mentor Milwaukee is really out here recruiting a lot of uh, folks to be mentors um, to young people. Next week, you will have a lot of opportunities to meet all kinds of different nonprofits that do um, need mentors. I wanted us to pull together this panel in particular. There's other panels out there and in the follow-up email, I'll provide links so you can watch those conversations too, where they talk about, you know, where they had, um, you know, legislators and the police involved to kind of let people know what the plans are and what the, the punishments are and the penalties. And, um, but I wanted this conversation to be a little bit different with people who have woke up and made a choice to, you know, spend their lives creating a village that will support our children and there this is a hard topic because property is being stolen i mean as adults we understand it you know your car you need it okay you need your car and a car is also a dangerous vehicle when it's being driven recklessly by somebody who doesn't know how to drive so property is being um destroyed people are dying um it's costing people folks thousands of dollars it's a huge income i mean this is it's one of those topics where folks are angry, and I understand that, but that anger is not going to change the situation when you know everything else that is going on in our community and all of the inequity and the racial inequity that is sort of engineering this situation. And I feel like we have to give equal voice to that engineering in the situation that these kids have been placed in. Um, and not just kind of brush it off with, you know, where are they mamas? And, you know, my mother was at work all the time, constantly. Um, I got into some trouble when I was younger, but I had a great network of people around me. I was heavily involved in school. I always had something uh, to do. I was in the choir. I was in the dance. I, mean, I was constantly doing something, always. Um, but I grew up in the projects. 
you know, and the, and the difference between me and the folks who were still in cars was the fact that I constantly had something to do <laughs> and I was made to do it. And I just feel like we have to start thinking differently about what we do with our volunteer hours and if we use our volunteer hours and how we view our community and how we look at these problems. It's always got to come back to us and what we can do as a community to change things and That's not it's them and where they mamas at, where they mamas is at work. So what are you doing right about yep. it? How can you help? You know, I always blame the mamas. It's like, always, where's, always where's the aunties? Where's the uncles? Where's the cousins? Like, it's right. like, even in CPS, it's the mama. Where's the mama? What about the dad? What about the grandfather? It's always the mom and the grandma. Fault. All of us. I mean, if you have a spare hour or two, I mean, I, there's so many resources and I'll share in the follow-up email. Um, uh, Again, check out Mentor MKE and uh, make sure you all know about this event that we're doing next week. You'll have an opportunity to sign up and make a huge difference. Yeah. And, and just in closing, I would definitely love to give a shout out to Safe Drive MKE, which is a grassroots collective that is prioritizing combating reckless driving. They have a goal called Vision Zero, which is uh, zero fatalities as a result of reckless driving. So they prioritize residents, community stakeholders, local government working together to solve uh, traffic safety through equity, educational engagement, engineering, and enforcement. So there, there's definitely, um, if, you're, if, you, if you are figuring out how to be a part of this work, there's definitely some great collectives who are doing this work. That's good. Absolutely. And I see someone, who is that, talking about the cultures and community, Karen. Okay, let me show you, Karen. Let's get back into, let's do our shout out again. I'll go back to my um, slide. As, as I'm finding that, um, the slide about in our cultures and communities, any final words for in the last couple of minutes from Vaughn, Kweku, Shannon, call to action, inspiration, thoughts quickly. Yeah, I'm going to be having monthly community meetings. I'm already meeting with some warriors. I met with someone today. So we're just, we can't stop it because we're not affected as a community. So I'm going to continue to reach out and see who can help move these mountains because we can't move them by ourselves. And then if anybody needs any youth workshop facilitators, that's me. I'm a trauma-informed youth workshop facilitator and I kick it and I keep it real with kids talking about independent living, reckless driving, job readiness within 45 days. You name it, I'm there. So I'm ready. Thanks, Shannon. Vaughn, there is a comment for you. Uh, make sure you uh, check that out before I close out the webinar. Do you have any final words? Um, yeah, we just need people to continue to support. Um, again, um, with the pandemic still being in place, we are trying to find ways to still engage young people. Um, we have a stipend program. Uh, we've had one since 2016 where we try to create jobs for them to do or create opportunities that put them around community orientated and community focused work, different leaders, organizers, teach them these skills as we mentor them um, and make just make jobs out of whatever we can. So um, I have a documentary I'm working on. Uh, we have the door to door gift drive that we're working on um, that happens in December. So these are all opportunities for us to um, pay young people to um, be engaged in that work and go through those experiences. And a lot of them, you know, it, it, it starts to, you know, once they experience those things, they, they start to like them and move towards more community um, orientated stuff. So we definitely need the support of people. Um, I got that comment. I'm going to connect uh, with them. Shannon, I'm going to connect with you. Um, Tiangelo, you already know, you know, um, we should all stay connected and do this work because we have to save our young people and we have to um, save our young people as our future in this city. Absolutely. Yes. Kweku, last word. Yeah, I'll, I'll be quick. The first thing I'll say is recognize that we are still in the pandemic. So please stay masked up. Please keep yourself safe, keep your family face. But you can also be a part of a bubble, a small group of people who you know are taking care of themselves. Uh, this, this is rich. The notion really should have been physically distant, not socially distant. You know what I mean? So that's mm -hmm. it's really about being physically distant. Uh, recognize the value of partnership and collaboration. Um, and also on the last piece, remember that these young people that are that are making these 
these reckless decisions, this is less than 10% of our young people. This is not a majority of our young people. We have a strong population of young people who are doing well, who are going to school, who are continuing to figure out what they want to do. So don't point the finger at young people, young people, young people. This is a very small population of young people and, in, and in also a similar population of adults. So don't feel like this is just young people. We have a role in raising our young people. As they always say, it takes a village and don't forget that. Beautiful, that was beautiful. Thank you so much. Folks that are still with us, uh, share some love in the, in the chat. Lots of you are already um, doing that. I really appreciate uh, everybody on the panel. This is a wonderful conversation and I, um, I feel like we have given a lot of good information um, help, you know, help people really look at this in a different way. Um, and I would not have been able to do that without you guys in particular. So thank you so much. Take a look at the chat. Actually, while you're doing that, I'm going to, people already know that I'm all about um, this. I don't know, do you guys love the Milwaukee Strong song as much as, uh, as much as I do, I'm kind of a I'm kind of a dork about it. I, I just love that song. I'm gonna play that to give people a chance to give you a love note, give you a chance to take a look at it. Everybody, get back to work. Um, that's for the participants and the panelists. If you don't have time to listen to the song, I guess you don't have to. But if you want to enjoy this together as a community, we make Milwaukee strong.
was great. I really did. <laughs> that was great. That's, that's my jam, y'all. Can you tell? <laughs> <laughs> that's my jam. Thank you guys so much. Thank you so much. I'm going to reach out and get some more resources and we'll just email a follow up to everybody. So anything that you can think of that you'd like to share, let me know. We'll get it out there. Okay. okay. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a happy day.